Story two of the Magic Wand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Magic Wand by Tudor Jenks. The Sultan's Verses. In a land so far to the east that it is very warm when the sun rises and quite chilly at sunset, a great sultan died. His successor happened to be a nephew who lived at some distance, so far away even from that distant land, that he wasn't at all intimate with the late sultan. In fact, they had met only half a dozen times, at Thanksgiving dinners or similar occasions, and consequently the new sultan shed no tears to quench his joy upon coming to the throne. He decided to rule wisely and justly, and therefore was eager to choose the most trustworthy advisers. When he arrived at his capital, he was conducted at once to the palace, and spent the first day or two in resting from his journey, and making the acquaintance of his courtiers, and buying becoming clothes. Among these courtiers was the vizier of the late sultan, a very gentlemanly old fellow, whose turban and beard were never more impressive than on first meeting. When the sultan arose late on the third day, he had decided to begin his reign, so he sent for the old vizier to have a private conversation with him in the throne room. Both sat down, cross-legged, in an attitude that would give American citizens the cramps, and the sultan opened the little powwow thus. Silla bin Rifraf. I think it is high time that I, that is, we, began our reign. Wisdom is heard, replied Riffraff, with the ease and indifference of an old courtier. And it strikes me, uh, us, the sultan went on, that it is an excellent opportunity for me to have our own way about several little matters that have long been in my mind. Your will is the people's law was Riffraff's safe answer, as he bowed like a china image. So I understand, the sultan assented. Of course, we shall for a while carry on business upon the usual lines, so far as public affairs are concerned, but it is not to public business that we are referring just now. Why, indeed, remarked Riffraff a little vaguely, as the sultan paused for he was thinking of something else. But so was the young sultan. So I say, the sultan replied. Now, so far as my own private affairs are concerned, I mean to have my own way about them. Yes? Yes. For instance, I have long desired to be a poet, said the sultan, looking aimlessly at the ceiling. The vizier started so abruptly that his turban fell off and then he, too, looked at the ceiling, until the sultan should choose to go on. It was a very embarrassing situation. In all the vizier's experience, nothing just like this had ever presented itself. The old sultan had been a very sensible man, according to the vizier's opinion, and had considered poetry, well, he hadn't considered it at all. There was a silence that lasted until the bulbul in the blue room had finished a long ditty. Then the vizier saw it was his move, so to speak, and he took refuge in a proverb, the first that occurred to him. Cheerfulness is perfectly consistent with piety, he said, shaking his head thoughtfully. So we think, said the sultan, and we shall therefore allow you to conduct the realm about, as usual for a short time, while we devote ourselves to poetry. Yuck! exclaimed the vizier, for he couldn't help it. Excuse me, said the sultan inquiringly. Every condition sits well upon a wise man, remarked Riffraff, who was fond of proverbs, especially when he didn't care to commit himself. But though that is all plain sailing, the sultan went on again, after trying a moment in vain to see what the proverb had to do with the subject. There is yet some difficulty, that is, to find a competent critic 
who will show me my faults and point out any little errors that may creep into my hasty lines now if you yourself ben riffraff should prefer to undertake this responsible post you can do so my sovereign master said riffraff hastily i am an old man let me care for the realm for that trade i have long studied i would prefer that another should become your critic and poetical adviser a younger man so be it answered the young sultan but let me at least read to you one set of verses which i happen to find in my kaftan i would like your judgment upon these lines before you betake yourself to your proper duties shall it be so the vizier saw by the look in the sultan's eye that the request was a command and he replied in oriental phrase that he was most honoured by the sultan's condescension so the young sultan drew out a roll of manuscript and read as follows youth is the season for hope hope befitteth the young youth has the vigour to cope with the woes that the singers have sung youth has the sparkle of mirth laughter delighteth the soul spring is the youth of the earth merrily let carols roll the sultan rolled up his manuscript and looked expectantly at ben riffraff what do you think of that asked the sultan give me your candid opinion as one private gentleman might to another now the vizier thought the lines were very poor indeed but he had often heard that poets were sensitive and he therefore believed he was doing a very wise thing when he replied oh your highness what thought what music how exquisite your rhymes soul and roll why it's a perfect rhyme i think you have chosen wisely indeed if i may be permitted to praise without the suspicion of flattery then you really like the little lines asked the sultan with a smile a peculiar smile like them why they should be embroidered with gold thread on silken scarfs your highness is right you are a poet let me attend to the petty business of governing and you can give yourself entirely to the sublime art of composition so be it said the sultan until i notify you to the contrary i will leave the reins in your hands now as you will have plenty to attend to will you kindly summon the chief treasurer as you go out thank you good morning the vizier salaamed and vanished through the curtained doorway and the page on duty outside noticed that the old vizier wore a broad grin as he walked down the arched corridor in a few minutes the sultan heard the jingling of the golden curtain rings and beheld the face of the chief treasurer a sedate and dignified man of middle age enter adham el shekels said the sultan kindly and be seated i would confer with you my lord the treasury is well supplied and the accounts straight no doubt interrupted the sultan but i have more important matters more important the treasurer began so amazed that he forgot his manners verily said the sultan overlooking the little breach of etiquette as the vizier has no doubt informed you i intend to devote my own time for the present to poetry he told you so did he not something of the sort your highness replied el shekels uneasily hoping that the sultan wouldn't ask him to repeat the vizier's joking remarks in fact the vizier had hinted that the young sultan thought himself a genius i suspected as much said the sultan and you were surprised perhaps your highness is the ruler responded the treasurer politely but i was surprised i admit and to tell the truth if you will pardon me for saying so i must say that as a rule there isn't much money to be made in poetry i speak simply as a treasurer your highness not as a critic but i wish your opinion as a critic the sultan answered the question of providing funds i leave to you for the present unless i should appoint you to the new office i mean to create 
that of chief critic and poetical adviser. The face of El Shekels had brightened when the new office was mentioned, but the brightness faded as the sentence ended. Your Highness is most gracious, but if it be your will, I prefer to remain treasurer. As you please, the Sultan replied. But meanwhile, I happen to have in my caftan a copy of verses that I have just completed. If you can spare the time, we shall be glad to have your opinion of them. Most certainly, gracious sovereign, was the answer of El Shekels, while his face assumed a weary expression, and he began to do sums in mental arithmetic. So, drawing forth the precious manuscript, the sultan began, Youth is the season for hope, and on he went, reading in a fine declamatory voice, as if trying to bring out the best points in the verses. When he concluded, he looked at the chief treasurer. Your Highness, the lines are above praise, said the treasurer. I hardly know which part to praise most. And that was true, for he hadn't paid very close attention. But I am sure your wisdom had led you aright. Your talents are far beyond my poor criticism. Let another be your chief critic. I am content to remain treasurer. It shall be as you say, the sultan agreed, at least for the present. And as you go out, will you be kind enough to send us the... Uh, what officer comes next to you in rank? The minister of justice answered the treasurer. Yes, I will see that he comes at once. Well, remarked the page at the door, the new sultan certainly makes the officers happy. How they do grin when they come back. Later in the afternoon, the page had reason to repeat this remark with added emphasis, for meanwhile he had admitted the greatest officers of the realm, and all, as they came from their interview with the young sovereign, were adorned by the same self-satisfied grimace. Stronger and stronger became the page's curiosity to know what it was that made all the courtiers so well satisfied with themselves. For after the first two or three had explained to the rest that the young sultan thinks he's a genius in the poetry line, and all you've got to do is to praise his verses, and you're sure to keep your place, it was as easy as rolling off a log to go in, hear the verses, and express your raptures, and come out in clover. But no one told the page about all this, and his curiosity about the interviews became very keen. He thought there must be something worth seeing in the throne room, for not long after each great official entered, he could hear a murmur of voices, and then such expressions as, Exquisite! Beautiful! Or, Perfect! Couldn't be better! Well, well, I never did. Never was anything like it. Strangely enough, the page's curiosity was gratified most unexpectedly. It was getting late, and the sultan had seen all the prominent officials of the palace. At length he came to the doorway and found the page sitting in attendance on rather a thin and hard cushion. Why, my boy, said the sultan kindly. You must be worn out. Have you been there all day? All day, your majesty, the page replied respectfully. And since your majesty asks me, I am a little tired. Come in, said the sultan, holding aside the curtain. You shall rest a while. What? With your majesty in the throne room? The boy exclaimed in amazement. Certainly. No one need know answered the sultan kindly. Are you afraid of me? No, your majesty, said the page, for the sultan smiled very cordially, and the page entered the throne room. Be seated, said the sultan. I command it, he added, as the boy hesitated. So the page sat down upon a soft silk cushion. I have been writing some verses said the sultan, as he bade the boy help himself to the delicious fruits and ices. And while you refresh yourself, I should like to read them to you. Your majesty is very kind, said the page, but suppose someone should come. 
No one will come, said the sultan decidedly, and he clapped his hands, summoned a slave, and bade him stand sentinel to keep out all intruders. So, while the boy enjoyed the fruits and ices, the sultan, for the twentieth time at least, read aloud his precious lines on youth. When he had finished, he turned to the page, saying, Now I should like your opinion of the poem. But, your highness, I am too young to criticise your verses, replied the page uneasily. All nonsense, answered the sultan, but pleasantly enough. I see you have an opinion. I desire you to express it freely. Nay, more than that, I command you to do so. I must obey, then, said the page, looking very serious. But if I should incur your majesty's displeasure, may I beg that you will visit your wrath upon me alone? I have a mother and sister who are dependent upon me. They shall be cared for, said the sultan, in a solemn tone, if the need arises. But you make me suspect that my lines do not meet with your approval. On your own head be it, commander of the faithful, exclaimed the unhappy page. By the prophet, as I promised my mother that I would tell truth, the lines are the veriest bosh and nonsense. They mean nothing. They do not even sound sensible. They are as unmusical as the braying of a lost donkey. There. I have said the truth. A man dies but once. Remember then your words. Allah be praised, cried the sultan. I have found a pearl. And all the men of my court declared the lines perfect, beyond praise. Now have I found the honest man I sought. But, y your majesty, stammered the astonished page, I am no more than a boy. Enough said the sultan. The years will find you wisdom as well as age. But honesty comes not even with long ages if the seed be not already planted. Say not a word. The sultan clapped his hands, directed all the courtiers to be summoned, and in their presence appointed the page, chief counsellor and grand high vizier of the realm, for life. At the same time, investing him with the order of the golden sunburst of the east, and a whole row of smaller decorations of different colours. When this ceremony was over, Silla bin Rifraf prostrated himself before the throne. Speak, Ben Rifraf, said the sultan. Would your majesty deign to inform his humble slaves what has caused the merited elevation of his favourite? Ben Rifraf inquired. Most willingly responded the sultan. I read my verses to this youth, and he has given upon them the wisest judgment of you all. But words cannot say more than we said, Ben Rifraf ventured to say. Did we not praise your highness's genius? Of a truth you did, replied the sultan. Yet were the verses the veriest trash, as ye well knew. Most true, sultan, came the chorus from the whole court, for they saw the tide had turned. And courage to tell this truth was found only in my page, whom I have made chief counsellor. Enough, the audience is at an end. Then, just before the band struck up an inspiring march, the voice of Ben Rifraf was heard reciting a well-known proverb, which in its original Arabic looks like a procession of earthworms, but which means in plain English, after wit is everybody's wit. End of story two.